artificial intelligence is every day reaching more deeply into our lives. The news you read, the job postings you see, maybe even the decision on a loan you applied for. When does that kind of reach make it time for public policy to get involved? Tim Huang has been working on exactly such questions. He is director of ethics and governance for the newly established AI Fund, which is a joint initiative on AI out of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard University. And we are delighted to welcome you here to TVO tonight. Thanks for having me, Steve. Let's just start with some definitions. So sure. what is the ethics and governance of AI Fund all about? So this is an initiative that was uh, launched earlier this year. It's spearheaded by two groups. Uh, one of them is the MIT Media Lab. Um, which is a program that's dedicated to kind of prototyping new technologies, uh, really at the edges of cutting edge technology. Um, and the Harvard Berkman Center, uh, which is a university-wide research center at Harvard that looks at tech and policy issues. And together, they're leading this project uh, to essentially work on questions around ethics uh, and the governance of AI, ensuring both AI is developed ethically and that it's governed appropriately. And you've got several million dollars to get going on this, uh, right? Yes, it's a $27 million initiative over the next few years. Hmm. How integrated, I mean, we gave some examples off the top, but how integrated, in your view, is artificial intelligence into people's everyday lives already? Well, that's kind of the amazing thing with AI, is when you think about and talk about AI, you usually think about, you know, HAL 9000 or science fiction or something like that. But the really fascinating thing about AI is it's actually in almost everything you use every single day nowadays. Um, so if you uh, do a search on a Google search bar, right, that's actually machine learning at work, a artificial intelligence at work. Um, and uh, if you use Google Maps, right, uh, if you're trying to route from one location to another, that also uses AI. And so really people are relying on this technology in a really fundamental way, even though they don't normally think about it that way. That's because they probably think about it as robots. We're not quite there yet. Well, I guess for assembling cars we are, but, sure. but not for humanoid robots, not yet. That's right, exactly. I mean, it's worth knowing that there's a big difference between AI, which is really a software thing, mm -hmm. and robots, which are kind of physical, right, physical objects. Mm -hmm. so. does, does where we're at actually lead to robots? Uh, it could lead to robots becoming ever more effective than they have been in the past. So if you've seen robots in action, right, um, you know, they might look really amazing in the movies, um, but if you ever see them in real life, they can often be quite clumsy. Uh, and it's because programming them has been traditionally really difficult, right? In order mm -hmm. to tell a robot how to do something, you have to walk through all the steps mentally to, in order to program it to do that task. Um, and the amazing thing about machine learning is it might really unlock ways of teaching those machines uh, how to accomplish certain tasks that we didn't think were possible um, even a few years back. Any sense of how deeply Canada is involved in any of this? Oh, Canada is deeply involved in this. Um, one really interesting thing, aspect about the kind of history of AI is that uh, even until a few years ago, uh, machine learning, which is the field of AI that is really driving a lot of the development today, was basically considered a, a dead end. Um, but it was in, actually, in fact, a number of key researchers uh, in Canada that were kind of keeping the torch alive for all those years. And now that the field is kind of growing once more and all these breakthroughs are happening, uh, Canada is actually really at the center of a lot of basic research that's happening and, and a lot of work to try to get this technology out of the lab and actually into uh, society and the economy as a whole. I can tell from having met you 10 minutes ago that you are highly enthusiastic about this. <laughs> is it possible to be too enthusiastic about this? I think that's right. I mean, the technology is very impressive. Impressive, but I think there's two important things to know. One of them is you don't want to sell it too hard, right? I think, Steve, one of the concerns is that um, if you think that the machines can do everything, you might deploy this technology in a way that's uh, irresponsible, for instance, or, or maybe you're putting it to a purpose that it was never designed to do. And that really could cause a number of different problems. Uh, and I think the second risk uh, that people need to really be aware of is that the technology also can be used for, for good purposes as well as bad purposes, right? And, and the technology itself is sort of neutral. We have to be concerned about who ends up using it. How well, in your view, have governments laid the groundwork for incorporating AI into their policy discussions over the last few years? You know, it hasn't been bad. It's been a big process of education. You know, um, again, as I mentioned, a lot of the AI discussion is very much uh, pop culture driven. Uh, and a lot of the work that I used to do before I joined the AI Fund was talking to policymakers, um, helping them to understand what's happening in the current world of uh, research around this technology. Um, and, and I think that increasingly they're getting a good picture of what the technology is and then going to where they're, they're needed, right? Trying to figure out where are the places where this technology is going to create some danger and where might we need to mitigate some of the risks. Well, let's, uh, let's play a game here. Sure. I'm putting, I'm deputizing you as the guy who's going to stand in front of a room full of 
in Canada cabinet ministers and uh -huh. the United States cabinet secretaries, maybe a president and a, and a prime minister in there as well. Sure. And your job is to tell them what they ought to be considering right now. Right. What are you telling them to do? So I think there's two big things to know. One of them is that the interesting thing about machine learning is that it's a very general use technology. This is something that can basically differentiate between whether or not there's a cat in an image or not a cat in an image. It's also a technology you can use in like medical diagnosis. And so it's important to know that you can't really regulate AI as a category. It sort of almost doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to do it that way. Instead, I think what we're going to have to look at is particular places where AI is being deployed, where it's going to put and produce like very special types of risks. For instance? Uh, so I think the medical space is a really big one. Uh, autonomous vehicles is another really big one. Uh, even the use of AI to do, for example, employment decisions. So there's a couple of really interesting companies out there that are saying, send us a resume. We'll analyze whether or not this person will be a good employee or not. And there's lots of risks on whether or not that will produce uh, biased or discriminatory results. But you know politicians are prone to regulate. They, right. So as you speak to them, is the advice to them, yes, regulate here, but don't regulate here? Or what is it? That's right. I mean, I think they have to evaluate the, the risks in various different places where AI might be deployed. And so I think what I would tell them is they should think about it and not to get caught up in the hype and to say, oh, man, everything is AI. This is some special thing. But to say a lot of the tools that we have, right? the tools that you know from regulating in the medical space, for instance, may really still be relevant here. The question is how you protect the rights that you've produced in the past and extend them into this new technological domain. How fast is it all developing? Uh, very fast. I think that's one of the most interesting things about the technology. And, and one of the big questions from a policy standpoint is, can regulators uh, keep up with how quickly the technology is, in fact, changing? Uh, and well, I think we certainly haven't been able to for the internet, for example. Sure, for right, space. right. And so this is one of the big questions is actually, what is the role of government? And I think there might be a really powerful role in government bringing the right people to the table, though we have to ask whether or not we think that something like regulation is going to be the most powerful way of, of shaping the space. Are you essentially a, a pro or anti-regulation kind of guy? I would say I'm a pro-regulation person, right? I mean, a lot of these technologies are still pretty early on. Um, and I think one really high-profile case of it going wrong uh, really could cause problems for all the other applications that we see in the space. And it's important that the technology gets deployed, deployed responsibly. And, um, and so it's important that we, we uh, think about what are the rules that should apply in the space. As this question comes out of my mouth, I, even I realize how odd it sounds. Uh -huh. <laughs> so hang in there with me. Does AI teach itself? Yes, it sort of does Explain in a really that. interesting way. So. Uh, the right way of thinking about this is that machine learning is really the science of writing these algorithms, software, that gets better the more that it uh, sees, right? the more examples it gets to experience. So for instance, if you want to teach a machine how to recognize a cat in an image, for instance, you need to recognize a, uh, a cat in an image. Or a cat. Uh, right. Yeah, sure. You need, you need lots of pictures of cats. Uh, and the more examples you show it, the better and better it gets at doing that task. And so what's interesting is that these machines, they do teach themselves, right? In that we haven't really programmed them, well, a cat is a thing with funny whiskers, and it's furry, and it has these colors. In fact, it learns it from seeing lots and lots of examples of what we're trying to teach it. Uh, and so I think it is really kind of a really amazing thing seeing that technology work. And many years ago, um, you know, they had tried the same methods, but it turns out that we just didn't have the data or the computational power um, to make this technology actually function. I don't want to sound overly gushing about this, but that's almost a human quality to be able to teach yourself to do better. Sure. And I think um, it's important to make sure that we, we, we continue to keep in mind that they are, in fact, machines. and Programmed by humans. Programmed by humans, right. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, one of the limitations, for instance, is that a lot of these machines really can't come up with their own goals. Right? So you could say, uh, I want to teach this machine how to recognize cats. It won't wake up tomorrow and say, uh, well, I really, my real passion is, is recognizing dogs and images. <laughs> now, that's not, that won't be really anything that these systems do. So, Because that's a key question, right? Whether or not these systems, and you, you mentioned HAL 9000 earlier sure. from, from 2001, A Space Odyssey, where, where HAL developed an artificial intelligence beyond what the humans programmed in it, and obviously looked out for itself ahead of what the humans uh, wanted it to do. Right. Do, you, do you ever worry that? it will acquire information beyond or qualities beyond what humans had intended in the first place. Well, yeah, and I think that intent question is really interesting. And there's a lot of work going into right now what's known as interpretability, right? Which is, can you understand why the machine makes the decision that it does? Um, because while this machine is training itself, some of these systems are complex to the point where even the computer scientists have some difficulty saying, oh, well, it thought it was a cat because it had this color or this shape. Mm. Uh, and there's a lot of research into doing that right now. Because part of the concern is that if you, if you don't know that, 
um, maybe the system will have some behavior that you don't anticipate when you put it out into the real world. And that, that really could be a safety risk, right? So you imagine um, a self-driving car, right? It needs a, a computer vision system to tell what's on the road. What if it recognizes uh, someone who is uh, in a costume, for instance, as an object that they're not, and then behaves accordingly? That's a real risk that I think um, the computer scientists and others are really having to work on and policymakers have to think about. They have got their heads around that. Uh, yes, and they are working on it at the moment. Okay. I'm going to show what a nerd I am here, but uh -huh. because this is well before you were born. But there was an episode of Star Trek called The Ultimate Computer. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and this is exactly what happened, sure. where, the, where the computer on the Enterprise could, could not recognize war games uh -huh. from actual war. Right. And right. things, as you can imagine, deteriorated yes. significantly. So you guys are on this, right? We shouldn't worry about this? <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, uh, if one of the things that should be done is a lot more investment in these types of problems. There's these really interesting kind of technical problems that if we don't solve, the technology really be, might be deployed in a way that is, it is risky, right? Or, or, or cause troubles that, troubles that we don't anticipate. Here's something quite odd, and I want to bring this to your attention sure. and get your comment on it. A ProPublica investigation, this mm. is this outfit in the States. Yes, that's right. From a year ago, found artificial intelligence was being used in your country to mm -hmm. determine whether people charged with crimes were likely to reoffend. Mm -hmm. That's right. And they found that even in this instance, there was a racial bias. The machine learned that a black person was more likely to reoffend than a white person, and that even in the facts, even if the facts in a particular case mm -hmm. showed otherwise. How does that happen? So it actually points to a really great example. And I'm glad you brought up the Compass study, because uh, I think it's one of the key, key examples that we're really seeing in this space as people think about what is the most responsible way of deploying the technology. And one of the big problems that emerged was actually that the data that was used to train this system uh, was itself biased, right? It was based on historical data about who had been arrested, hmm. right? It embeds all sorts of interesting biases about the criminal justice system. And in some ways, the Compass system was just working to replicate that in some ways, so reinforce the machine, those effects. The machine didn't learn to be biased. Uh, well, it learned from the data, it learned to, from be the data. to be biased. Didn't and the data it its itself was biased. Well, no, so it learns what we teach it in some sense, right? And the data here was, was bad data, right? And so as a result, it, it, it learned sort of an interesting inference that we, we, are, we don't find permissible, right, of course, that people should be determined, uh, that their risks should be determined on the basis of their race. And so I think this is one of the, one of the concerns we need to be careful about is we provide the data, is the data truly representative or diverse in the way that we want in order to make sure that the, the system can do the task that we want it to do. Do researchers think about fairness when they are drawing up their algorithms? Yeah, so this is actually increasingly uh, a, a realm of research in the machine learning field, uh, where particularly in light of things like the Compass study, there's a greater discussion among technical people about how do you actually want to ensure that a system is, is fair? Um, and it actually turns out to be very complicated, right? Uh, just like as it was complicated in the law to try to figure out, well, what's a fair decision? Um, now trying to implement those concepts uh, in a technical sense is, is really becoming a big realm of research. Uh, and so this is actually like a, increasingly a topic. Um, and I would say right now within the field, there's a push to try to get people who are designing machine learning systems uh, to really kind of bring it into their work on an everyday basis. Because it would kind of be really awful. Never mind the, the conscious and or unconscious bias sure. that people have to deal with in society today. It would be really lousy if we programmed that unknowingly into our computers as well. That's right. So like one yeah. of the examples that people have given is, uh, so I mentioned the, that technology where you send a resume and then we determine whether right. or not you're a good candidate based on the text of your resume. And a lot of that's based on underlying data that may actually have gender biases built into it. And so hmm. some kind of concerns about, well, you know, if this person shows up as a, you know, a, a female candidate for this job, but the system doesn't affiliate the gender with the job that they might be willing to hold, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, they might get knocked out of the system right away. And so, so it is a big issue. Tim, talk to us about privacy and how much privacy protection AI imagines going forward. Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, in order to get machine learning to work uh, nowadays, there's some exceptions. You need a lot of data in order to train the machine how to do even a relatively simple task. So the one that I talked about earlier where uh, a machine learns to see a cat in an image. Now that, that could really take hundreds of thousands, if not millions of images to pull off in a really good, accurate way. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a really big question when that comes to personal data, right? When you train a machine to say, we want to give you the best recommendation for uh, the next book to read based on all the other books that you've read in the past, um, we start to have to dig into personal information. And 
you know, I think what we're seeing right now is that there's a big correlation between getting these systems to work and being able to access large amounts of data. And so there's an obvious question about privacy and what are the rules that we want to govern um, the use of this, this, this data to, to develop these technologies. Because I think while we see there's big societal benefit, we also don't want to trade off too much of our privacy in order to get them to work. Let me pick up on the data angle because um... I don't know if you're a big baseball fan, but I'm a big baseball fan. Yeah. And there's a great debate in baseball about going with your gut versus all of the analytics mm -hmm. and sabermetrics. And, yeah. uh, and you know, and you know, depending on the day of the week, I don't know which side I'm on. Uh, any concerns among you that we are too reliant on data in your world? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, the system only knows what it knows, right? Mm -hmm. And part of the problem of feeding in data is that it reflects the past. And things are always changing. Mm -hmm. And part of the worry is that these machines actually learn a model that doesn't actually reflect what reality looks like. Um, and, and I think that's going to be one really big concern for these systems in the future is, are they robust when things change? So say I come up with a robot that's cleaning a factory floor, right? Um, will that same software work for programming a robot that is cleaning a living room? Right? Maybe it cleans up the cat when it's cleaning up the living room, right? <laughs> because its goal on the factory floor is actually quite different when it's trying to clean up a house. And so I think those kinds of context shifts are going to be really important. Uh, and, and we want to make sure that the data actually works to train what's called the representation, that the machine actually learns the task well across many different situations. You've used cats in three examples oh, sure. already. You've got, you got to think about cats, don't well, you? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing in the field. A lot of the early <laughs> machine learning examples are all based on cats. So, How much responsibility do you think companies themselves have to bear for the protection of our privacy at the end of the day? Uh, I think they have a big responsibility to do so. Um, you know, a lot of these technologies are based on this idea that you provide the data and that you should get some kind of benefit from it. And part of that also means that you're responsibly stewarding the data that you do collect. And so I think companies do bear a really important responsibility. And they also have a responsibility, I think, to investigate ways of doing machine learning that are privacy protecting. Hmm. So there's these really interesting technologies right now called federated learning. So the idea is rather than sending all your data into some big machine in the sky, right, to the cloud, um, you might be able to keep all your data on device with only a tiny little bit being shared out, right? And mm. that's a completely different new architecture that people are trying to, uh, to investigate right now that if it works, really could create these good trade-offs where you don't have to give up too much of your data in order to get the benefit from the technology. It's interesting. It's sort of going the opposite of where we're headed right now. Headed right that's now. right, that's exactly. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to make two statements, and I want you to tell me which one is closer to what you think is the truth. OK. People are terrifically excited about the possibilities of AI. People are desperately wary about the future of AI. <laughs> uh, I mean, I would answer both, but I think wary is more like it at the moment. Um, I think uh, people are concerned about the technology, often because it is so kind of deeply ingrained in popular culture. Um, that I think we, we usually tend to overestimate how far this technology has come. And, and I think it is advancing quite quickly, but I think we're a long way off from you know, killer robots or machines trying to take over the world. No, I hear you, but yeah. it, it doesn't even have to be that, that futuristic. Sure, I mean, sure. th there, we are suspicious enough today of everything mm -hmm. that we probably think AI may come along and it won't put my interests first, it'll put somebody else's interests first. Mm -hmm. Now, are we wrong to think that way? No, I think we should be concerned, like we should be concerned with any kind of new technology on that front. Uh, and I think it actually trust, right, ensuring trust in these systems and really genuine trust, right, like that we can actually put our faith in these machines to kind of do and look after our interests um, is a really big question, right? Um, and, and that's a big question about how much the companies reveal, how much the machine reveals, and how much you can actually get into the, the guts of these systems, what the transparency looks like. Hmm. Let me ask you one last question. Sure. You're 30, right? Uh, I am. 30 years old. So chances are you're going to be around for a heck of a long time <laughs> to see this through. What turns you on the most about it all? Uh, I think the really intriguing thing is the kinds of AI that you sort of don't expect that really seem to have a big uh, chance of kind of making a lot of benefit to the world. Um, so uh, for example, there's a recent project that used AI to lower the amount of energy that a data center was consuming, right? Basically used it to intelligently uh, distribute energy in a data center to be more efficient and more green. And that seems to make a big difference if you can roll that out on a society-wide level. So I'm really excited by the possibility of using the technology to kind of really forward uh, public benefit. What's the one thing you want to see? Uh, I'd love to see uh, more technology being used to, to address questions of global warming. Hmm. And you think that'll happen in your lifetime? I think it'll happen, yeah. Cool. Tim Wong is the director of, director of Ethics and Governance of AI Fund, which is out of two universities, 
in New England. And we're grateful you spared some time for us here at TVO tonight. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.